title of this talk suggests three questions. One is, what is the spiritual significance of jihad? The second is, what does this have to do with Islamic economics? I know that you have uh, James Buchanan here, so that might be heresy to say there is such a thing even as Islamic economics as opposed to other. Uh, and why do they matter? And one thing that I'd like to just ask, do we have anybody here who have, has an economics background by any chance? Oh, very good. Are, are you from the economics department? I see. I'm just getting to a sense of and, and yourself. All right, wonderful. And I saw a third person. Yes. I see. So you're just getting started. Well, let's see if we can deconstruct a few things in this in this talk then. Um, regarding the first question on the meaning of jihad. That's unfortunately been obscured, obviously, by this erroneous Western image of Islam as a religion of the sword. And although jihad in its outward meaning does relate to the defense of the Islamic world from invasion by non-Islamic forces, it was upon the return from the Battle of Badr, which threatened the existence of the early Islamic community, in which the prophet of Islam said, you have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. This greater jihad, which describes the inner meaning of jihad and its spiritual significance, uh, is a struggle to integrate the whole of life around a sacred center. And the corresponding doctrines, of course, exist in all major religious traditions. Within Christianity, this inner struggle is indicated by Christ's statement, Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And so the primary meaning of jihad is derived from the root jihada, which means to strive. So it's a struggle for the sake of God. And inwardly, it means to struggle against anything that separates us inwardly from God. And so the military aspect of jihad is really the lowest level meaning. And so applied to Islamic economics and in answer to the second question, the Quran suggests that to struggle for a living is tantamount to defending the faith. So that the Prophet stressed this fact before the Battle of Badr, when a young man was with a strong physique was running to his shop uh, in the area where the Prophet was marshalling his men. Someone remarked that he wished that this young youth would use his body and health to run in the way of God by enlisting to defend the faith. And the Prophet responded, if this young man runs with the intention of not depending on others, and refraining from begging. He is in the way of God. That is a jihad. If he strives for the livelihood of his weak parents or weak children, he is in the way of God. If he tries to show his health out of pride, he is in the way of the devil. So the idea of our intentions that we bring to work uh, determines this. So according to this view, every aspect of life is sacred, for nothing is outside the absolute. There's no aspect of life is profane because everything is attached to God. And so what would appear to be the most mundane of activities has religious significance, implying that work should fulfill a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs. And so if this were not possible, we'd have to face an awkward question, as Brian Keeble points out. How it ever came about that in order to sustain his earthly existence, man should be obliged to follow a course of physical action that seems a direct denial of his deepest nature. As if by some ghastly mistake of his creator, it's man's destiny to follow a direction that leads him away from the very thing it is his nature to be. If we are to avoid such a dilemma, we must conclude that in some way work is or should be profoundly natural and not something that must be avoided or banished as being beneath our dignity. So if work is not only supposed to help keep us alive, but is also supposed to help us strive, as in that inner jihad, towards perfection and fulfilling a hierarchy of needs, then we can derive three purposes of human work, as E.F. Schumacher suggests. The first is to provide necessary and useful goods and services. 
Second, to enable each one of us to use and thereby perfect our gifts like good stewards. Third, to do so in service to and in cooperation with others so as to liberate ourselves from our inborn egocentricity. So all three of these objectives are really forms of jihad from an Islamic point of view. So that's the connection between jihad, broadly defined, the hierarchy of levels of meaning, and the spiritual significance of work. And so jihad applies not only to what we do, but how we make. And so therefore, uh, obviously economists would all agree with the first objective of work, to provide necessary and useful goods and services. All economists would agree with that. But some recognize the others to various degrees, acknowledging that different types of work have different effects. So for example, Adam Smith also acknowledged the second objective of work in a psychological sense rather than a spiritual uh, sense, and he argued that an extremely high division of labor that just employs very few of our faculties uh, will really have serious social costs because it will reduce certain human potentialities. And so he states, the understandings of the greater part of men are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it's possible for a human creature to become. But in every improved and civilized society, <laughs> that's debatable, uh, this is the state into which the laboring poor, that is, the great body of people, must necessarily fall unless government takes some pains to prevent it. And so what was the pains that uh, Adam Smith was suggesting? He was suggesting have a hard day of work on the assembly line, let's read some poetry or something like that. And of course, that's very problematic. That's not going to restore our humanity. After a day of work on the assembly line, uh, nobody will just, we'll just collapse. And so other figures, however, such as James Mill, who was the father of John Stuart Mill, opposed the view of Adam Smith. James Mill denied the existence of such harmful effects and argued that all types of works were homogeneous in terms of the second objective. In other words, James Mill and also David Ricardo, another very famous uh, classical economist who followed Mill, adopted a view that saying that, you know what, work is just all about matter in motion anyway, and so therefore those spiritual, those psychologically stultifying effects that Adam Smith had referred to really don't exist. It's all homogeneous. Everything is just matter in motion. And so therefore, the second objective doesn't really even apply to economics. So that was the difference. In addition to that, James Mill and David Ricardo denied that the third objective was even possible. The third objective being to liberate ourselves from our inborn egocentricity. Why is that? Because they were psychological hedonists. <laughs> In other words, they believed that all of our actions are motivated by egoism, and so it's impossible by definition to escape uh, from that. And so that left, for some economists, only the first objective of work. And so you have some economists like Adam Smith who take a broader view, other economists who take a very narrow view, and in the current environment, you have economists taking a broad range, you know, sometimes mixing and matching, uh, depending on their particular philosophical outlook. And so you have a variety of syncretic positions being adopted in the current context. Now, our view of these various positions clearly have important implications for the link between ethics and economics. How we judge those three objectives is going to determine what is the link between ethics and economics. It's also going to determine to uh, what extent economic realities can be governed by their own logic. And we'll unpack that statement uh, in just a bit. And therefore, it's going to affect how it is that we view and assess industrial capitalism and industrial socialism, as well as how we view neoclassical mainstream economic theory in its assessment of those. So how we view these three objectives of work is going to be very crucial for everything else that follows. So those first two questions on, do, is there a spiritual significance to jihad, a hierarchy of levels of meaning? and how it applies to economics, the implications of that are really quite uh, significant.
So, when we're applying this to Islamic economics, on one hand, Islamic law establishes a minimum division of labor to fulfill the first objective of work. It asserts that some members of the community must practice each profession in order to fulfill the needs of society. Because obviously we can't produce everything by ourselves. We need some division of labor so that we can cooperate with one another uh, to provide the goods collectively. So the division of labor is thus analogous to other collective duties in Islamic law, fard al-kafe, which means a collective obligation. The idea that, for example, when you have orphanages or hospitals, so long as some members of the community are building those orphanages or in hospitals, that relieves everyone else in the community of that spiritual obligation. So this is something that a few people in the community can fulfill and it releases everyone else from that obligation. If nobody fulfilled those obligations, those collective obligations, then everybody would be held spiritually responsible for that uh, before God on the Day of Judgment. And so therefore, Islamic law establishes the division of labor as not just a right, but a duty. It's a duty, not simply a right. On the other hand, the division of labor must leave ample room for human creativity, according to the Islamic intellectual heritage. So the first floor was established by the Islamic legal heritage. The ceiling is going to be established by the Islamic intellectual heritage. And so that second objective of work to use and thereby perfect our gifts like good stewards, a too extreme division of labor creates an unsustainable trade-off between the various objectives of work. Because what is it that's driving the idea of specialization productivity? And so the idea that Adam Smith and other economists had that got economics going was let's make the trade-offs between the first, second, and third objectives of work. Now, from the Islamic perspective, if we do make those trade-offs, that can lead to lopsided development that fails to provide people with psychological and spiritual fulfillment and fails to keep nature clean and self-replenishing. And so from the Islamic point of view, these trade-offs can, can exist in the short term and medium term, but they cannot exist in the long term. They're not sustainable in the long term. As Sayyid Hussein Nasr, one of the leading Islamic studies scholars in the West, has said, equilibrium on the socio-economic plane is impossible to realize without reaching that inner equilibrium, which cannot be attained save through surrender to the one and living a life according to the dictum of heaven. And so accordingly, only when the division of labor is above that minimum, the floor set by Islamic law, and below the ceiling established by the Islamic intellectual heritage, are we going to have integral development that fulfills all three objectives of work, and that is sustainable in the long run. And so uh, by integral development, what we mean is development that addresses the whole of the person, not just the part, the material needs but the whole of the person and for every person. And so balancing all three in such a way that no single dimension is emphasized at the expense of others. Now, when we walk through the history of the loss of the third objective, uh, what happens in the history of economic thought is that basically when nature becomes secularized or God's art becomes secularized, that leads to the secularization of our art, of human, what we make. And so therefore, industrial production process, processes set in after the sciences of nature were secularized. So you have the secularization of the sciences of nature and therefore God's art is secular, you know, denied its spiritual meaning. And that leads to the establishment of industrial production processes that basically deny any spiritual meaning in how it is that we make. And so what winds up happening is that if we lose that second objective of work, 
can we rely on producers cooperating together for the common good to achieve equilibrium by design? If work doesn't have any spiritual meaning, we can't rely on the producers cooperating together. In the traditional times, before industrial production processes came to the fore, the idea was that you would have craftsmen who would have understand the spiritual significance of their those work processes. And so you would have each craftsman make the whole, the whole shoe, the whole dress, the whole suit, whatever it was. You didn't have people simply making parts. Because if the shoemaker is only making part of the shoe, the heel of the shoe, and doesn't have a vision of the whole, is not participating in the whole, that part, in a sense, making that part deprives that work of any spiritual significance. It's maybe because it's not related to the whole. And so in those traditional production processes, you had the whole made, so work was not fragmented. And therefore, you also had, for the third objective of work, the idea that the craftsmen would cooperate together to ensure market equilibrium by design rather than by accident. In other words, they would set just prices if they saw that one of the fellow craftsmen were, not, were out of work or didn't have sufficient work, they would not, the other craftsmen would not hire on new apprentices. So in other words, you would have equilibrium occur by design, by cooperation, rather than competition. And so in the history of economics, uh, you have the second and third objectives, in a sense, going together. When the second objective was secularized and work lost its spiritual meaning, you could no longer rely on the producers to cooperate for the common good, because then they could exploit the public. And so then, economics really gets going, number one, by making the trade-off between the first and second objective, but now we have a problem, how do we achieve the, uh, we can't use co cooperation in the third objective, so how are we gonna get equilibrium by competition rather than by cooperation? So economics really gets started as a science as an independent science based on the problems that follow from the secularization of production processes. The second objective deals with production processes. The third objective deals with exchange processes. Once production processes are secularized, it's going to create a question as to how you're going to get equilibrium under competition with the secularization of exchange processes, since you're no longer relying on uh, cooperation. And so the entire dynamic of economics is really motivated by this whole question of trade-offs and the secularization of work. And so uh, this question introduces all kinds of problems. It introduces two, let's divide them into short-term problems and long-term problems. The short-term problems are one of simply achieving economic equilibrium in the short term. How are we going to be sure that markets are going to be in equilibrium? And we see all kinds of you know, chaos going uh, on around us uh, in today's world. And then the long-term problem deals with the environmental crisis. Uh, and so uh, what, with regard to the short-term problems, that's really the third objective of work, economists attempted to prove that competition will lead to equilibrium rather than, you know, at just as good at equilibrium as a cooperation would. But obviously, intuitively, we, we, we can sense that there's going to be a problem with that. Let's just take a very simple example that uh, Barbara Wooten brings up. Let's say that during a certain period, there are consumers who are willing to buy two million pounds of potatoes at two pence a pound. Uh, and uh, that's the minimum price that will induce potato growers to grow those two million pounds of potatoes. Then according to that, the price mechanism, the production of that quantity, and no more is justified. Now, what if one particular farmer is really happy with that and says, you know what, I'm going to increase my production because I'm very happy with that price and I'd like to expand production. 
the only way the market's going to stay in equilibrium is if some other farmer decides to decrease production by an equivalent amount. Otherwise, you're going to have this kind of lag time and the market is going to be con constantly in a state of disequilibrium. And so Frank Knight, one of the leading economists of the last century, thought that this market coordination problem, which results in the lag in the response of an effect to its cause, because you know by the time you get the pricing and then make your production decisions and then go to the next round of the market, you have this lag between cause and effect. Uh, this problem of lag time is arguably uh, a prima facie case in favor of central planning and control. In other words, communism, industrial socialism, depending on how you define those terms, if it could be guided by complete foresight and were free from evils of its own. That's a big if, obviously. <laughs> now, if we apply those three objectives of work from an Islamic point of view, which is going to be worse, industrial socialism or industrial capitalism? Any guesses? <laughs> Indust you, you say industrial capitalism will be worse than industrial socialism? All right, that's, pardon me? Well, he, right, right, right. Now here's, that's, this is a little bit of a bait, you know, question. It seems that would be the direction that I'm going in, but actually it's not. The reason that industrial socialism would be actually worse than industrial capitalism from an Islamic perspective is because the second objective of work is lost under industrial socialism as well. Right? In other words, the idea of the spiritual significance of work is lost under industrial socialism, just as it's lost under industrial capitalism. Now, if the spiritual meaning of work is lost under industrial socialism, then that means that the good will that you're going to need to have to make industrial socialism work isn't going to be there. And that's exactly what we saw in the case of communism in the Soviet Union. That's why it collapsed. It was ultimately unproductive. And of course, James Buchanan here at George Mason University, there's this whole public choice literature that shows how it is that if you have ten, a small group, take for example, ten people cooperating with one another to split a million dollars, they're going to have a lot more incentive to do so than if you have a million people cooperate, you know, trying to split a million dollars. And so what you have under communism, and the same thing, special operations of special interest groups, is that you have a minority has an incentive to exploit the majority. And that's exactly what started to happen under industrial uh, socialism. And so it turns out, in addition, many economists would argue that the amount of information that you would need to have to plan, uh, uh, you know, an economy with a high division of labor optimally, you know, nobody could really have that. And we could get into all the reasons for that, and I, the economists in the audience know that. Uh, but the point is, is that from the point of view of motivational assumptions, they're not there for industrial soci uh, socialism, and the information that we would be required to have it is also not there. So it turns out that actually industrial socialism will lose all three objectives of work more quickly than industrial capitalism. So don't, I do not mean to uh, argue from this point of view that it, therefore industrial socialism is better than industrial capitalism. That's not the direction that this, um, an Islamic critique would go. And so therefore, it's, if you look at the literature of Islamic economics, generally speaking, it's much more critical of industrial socialism uh, than it is of industrial capitalism. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact that we have these industrial production processes in place create these problems in terms of short-term equilibrium. And so you have some members of the community uh, losing all three objectives of work, at least in the short term, because of those uh, questions of, of disequilibrium. And so that's very difficult to get around. Now, the long-term problems that are associated with the loss of the second objective of work and these trade-offs are even more uh, severe. Uh, E.F. Schumacher, who was one of the most important economists of the last century from at least an Islamic perspective or any religious perspective, uh, said 
at the beginning of his uh, wonderful book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered, that it's a myth that we've solved the problem of production. He begins his book with that. He said, we think we've solved the pro problem of production. We haven't. And the reason is that basically what we're doing is we're trading capital as income. Capital in the sense of the environmental capital that's being worn down as a result of pollution and industrial production processes, the social capital that's being worn down, and of course the depletion of non-renewable uh, resources. And so all three of these are forms of capital that we are treating as income. And so we have the illusion that we've solved the problem of production, when in fact we really have not. And so there's this massive long-term problem that we uh, have to address. And so uh, I guess let me uh, kind of skip ahead because I think in terms of our time constraints, how are we? Oh, just 10 more minutes. All right. <laughs> well, it's like it's, I went too long on this part. All right. So let me go ahead and um, uh, skip forward then to uh, the question of many people think or, or try to argue that uh, in a sense this running down of environmental capital, non-renewable resources, and uh, social capital has a technological fix, right? That's what we all hope for. Science and technology will come up with a solution and so we can make these trade-offs sustainable in the long term. It's true, the short-term problems are very difficult and we try to minimize the effects of those, but that the long-term problems can be addressed through a technological fix. And there is a, a big debate over that. Now, whether or not such a technological fix is possible depends on whether or not the reductionist paradigm that motivated all of this to begin with corresponds to the nature of reality. If the reduction of quality to quantity that philosophically was the basis for philosophy and science and the technology behind the Industrial Revolution, if that does not correspond to reality, if that paradigm does not correspond to the nature of reality, then attempting to find a technological fix within that paradigm will lead to a vicious cycle of technologies that backfire, ending in catastrophe. So Edward Michan, a very well-known uh, welfare economist, relates the following true story to make this point. He says, I speak with imperfect recollection of the details of a true story told by an American physician about a man who, having a spot of arthritis in his finger joints, was given some tablets by his doctor as a result of which he developed a stomach ulcer. The doctor operated on the ulcer and injected the patient with strong antibiotics which so interfered with his cardiovascular system that the doctor felt obliged to perform a number of minor operations. The patient became weaker and was referred to a heart specialist. In his weakened condition he contracted a lung infection and notwithstanding the continual attention of three doctors and the intensive care of the hospital staff expired within two weeks of the heart operation. As it transpired then, after the high-powered medical treatment had all but destroyed the patient, the doctors using more high-powered medicine prolonged his life for those two weeks. This case, I'm assured, is not atypical. I don't mean to offend any of the physicians in the audience. I know that we have some here. But in short, if science and technology are based on philosophical presuppositions that don't correspond to the nature of reality, then serious unintended consequences follow for both man and nature. And so the solution is to recognize the erroneous presuppositions in a fragmented view of man and nature and draw the correct conclusions. And from this point of view, those who hope for a technological fix within the current paradigm are substituting a secular faith for a traditional one. And this is quite literally true in the light of the history of the notion of progress. I mean, if you look at, you know, these positivistic cults of St. Simon and others, I mean, they literally 
developed almost like the, an analog for the Catholic Church, you know, these high priests of progress and so forth. And so um, let me go ahead and just try to summarize the rest of the, the, the discussion um, as follows. Basically, what's motivating all of this is the reduction of quality to quantity and the history of the secularization of economic thought. First, get started with the secularization of, first of all, you have Cartesian bifurcation. Descartes reduces quality to quantity, setting off the beginning of modern philosophy, and that provides the kind of philosophical background in which there's this irreducible gulf between the subject that knows and the object that is known. And therefore, with that irreducible gulf, and the object that is known is a purely quantitative object. It's no qualities are objective. All qualities are subjective. And therefore, work cannot transform us inwardly. If there is an irreducible gulf between the knowing subject and the object that is known, that means, and the object that is known is purely quantitative, work has no, we are not transforming ourselves when we are engaged in work processes. So Cartesian bifurcation, that's just the philosophical term for those two elements, separation, irreducible gulf between the subject and object, and the reduction of the object to pure quantity. Cartesian bifurcation, in a sense, divorces philosophy from theology. And kind of puts the nail in the coffin of that divorce. That, in turn, secularizes the sciences of nature with the scientific revolution, Cartesian bifurcation establishing the philosophical basis for that. The following century then follows on with the secularization of production processes. It's just following naturally. And so with the secularization of those production processes, then that sets up the problem that Adam Smith and the classical economists have to solve. So all of this goes back to philosophical roots. So classical economics gets started in classical economic theory through the secularization of those second and third objectives of work. Then you have the second leg or this, you know, the next domino that falls with Cartesian bifurcation is the reduction of quality to quantity in the first objective of work. Because before we talked about classical economic theory secularizing the second and third objectives. Neoclassical theory, which is based originally in its first you know, incarnation or manifestation, was based explicitly on psychological hedonism by Jeremy Bentham and so forth. Psychological hedonism assumes there's no distinction between needs and wants. All of our pleasures, are maybe quantitatively different, but they're qualitatively the same. So the benefit that we get from an apple, a knife, a mattress, a shirt, all of these things are qualitatively similar, but quantitatively different. And so we can think of the first objective as, in a sense, denying the distinction between needs and wants. In, in terms of what neoclassical theory adds to the secularization process. And so think of a brick of gold. A brick of gold is made of homogeneous parts. There's no qualitative differences within the brick of gold. And so if we cut a brick of gold in two, we get, what, two smaller bricks of gold. But if we have a whole composed of qualitatively different parts rather than an aggregate, which is all homogeneous, and we split a whole, let's say we cut a human being in two. We don't get two little human beings, right? We get one dead human being. And so the whole is not reducible to the sum of its parts. And so what neoclassical theory added in its first phase of neoclassical theory was to secularize now the first objective of work, whereas classical economic theory secularized the second and third objectives, Neoclassical theory takes it a step further with psychological hedonism and secularizes now the first objective of work, denying this distinction between needs and wants, values and tastes. And so when it comes to the environmental crisis, what does that then imply? It implies a basis for rationalizing the trade-offs between future generations' needs for our wants. Because there's no qualitative difference between so it throws out all of the rules of traditional rules. And let me give you a concrete example of this. If we have a situation in which 
property rights are distributed in such a way that somebody comes to us and asks us, how much would you be willing to pay to stop pollution from occurring? And let's say that we're opposed to pollution, but we can only spend $100 to stop it. If we reverse the property right, and so we have the property right to stop the pollution, so somebody has to pay us instead of us paying them, and they ask us, how much would you be willing to accept to allow pollution to occur? This reduction of values to tastes and quality to quantity implies that if we're willing to pay $100 to stop pollution, we're willing to accept $100 to allow it. It's the equation of willingness to accept and willingness to pay. And this is obviously brought out in the famous example of the Coase theorem, for which uh, Coase won the Nobel Prize, or one of the reasons he won the Nobel Prize. And so the idea is that all of cost-benefit analysis is based on this idea of a utility function in which willingness to accept is equated with willingness to pay, and therefore it sneaks psychological hedonism into economic theory through the back door. Because in the second phase of neoclassical theory, they then claimed that the theory was neutral. At least the early neoclassical economists had the integrity to admit this is based on psychological hedonism. But after a while, that became a source of embarrassment to economists, and therefore they tried to make the claim that neoclassical theory was, could accommodate any set of values or tastes, not simply psychological hedonism. And so, I don't mean to get too far into the technical details of this, but for your economics class, when they talk about the continuity axiom, they, economists routinely present the continuity axiom as, as just a technical uh, device to eliminate lexicographic utility functions, uh, but that it has, it's just a mathematically uh, a tool for simplifying uh, calculations that has no philosophical, uh, you know, substantive uh, elements associated with it. That's totally false, because what the continuity axiom does is actually sneak in psychological hedonism through the back door. So the ultimate secularization of economic theory, and therefore the ultimate secularization of, uh, you might say, environmental economics, comes from this second, in a sense, reduction of quality to quantity that flows also from Cartesian bifurcation. So the secularization of all three elements, all three objectives, ultimately flows from this bad philosophy, you might say, uh, that is kind of getting into economics as an almost domino effect. And so fortunately, you have uh, with quantum mechanics now, and now we obviously don't have time to get into this, but what all of this does is that it really kicks the debate up to a whole new level. For us to understand, to resolve these questions, E uh, economists, qua economists, cannot resolve these issues. These are philosophical questions that economists have to kind of take off their economist hat and put on a philosopher's hat. We have to kick the debate up to the philosophical level where it belongs. We cannot simply uh, pretend that we're not making philosophical assumptions and try to substitute technical market solutions for moral problems we have to have a philosophical debate. And in this philosophical debate, it ultimately goes back to the role of the relationship between philosophy and science. And I'll just conclude, and maybe we can uh, discuss this more in question and answer, that the Islamic sciences of nature uh, and the Islamic philosophy of nature provide a total refutation of this reduction of quality to quantity. And paradoxically, it's quite remarkable, that in the quantum mechanics, you know, the paradoxes that we find in quantum mechanics, it's proving that something is wrong. And there's actually an Islamic solution to this that resolves per quantum paradox on one hand and integrates the findings of physics into higher orders of knowledge on the other that's based on a non-reductionist paradigm that allows for the resolution of these debates and therefore takes us back to full circle, to re-sacralize production processes and thereby exchange processes and our theory of consumption for all three objectives of work. Okay.